Okay, I think we can begin. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, welcome to this online seminar of the Illiberalism Study Program at the George Washington University. My name is Marlene Larel, I'm the director of the program, and I'm delighted to have today with us a, a good colleague of uh, our uh, program, Samuel Rogers, and a discussant, Balind Madlovich, who will arrive very soon. And we are here to discuss Samuel's new book, The Political Economy of Hungarian Authoritarian Populism. It's really a fascinating book that I invite you to look at it discussing state business relation and uh, the role that uh, capitalist relations are playing in structuring the Hungarian regime. And Samuel's book is really part of this really important trend, I think now of kind of reintroducing the role of economic structure, neoliberalism, capitalism in our understanding of uh, populist, illiberal, authoritarian regime, whatever the terms. Uh, we want to use, and Sam's book is contributing to that debate in a very interesting way. So let me say a few words about our speakers today. Samuel Rogers is a political economist. He has been working on qualitative research on the dynamics and effect of infrastructure development and investment in Europe and uh, um, Asia. He's part of a European Research Council funded project at the Open University and also a visiting scholar at the Osto Europa Institute at the Free University in Berlin, working uh, not only on Hungary, but on, but on China uh, uh, also. And our discussant is Balint Mladlovic, a political scientist and economist who is a research fellow um, at the CEU Democracy Institute in Budapest, who has been already presenting uh, with us uh, one of his former books written with a colleague of him, Balint Maya, on the anatomy of post-communist regimes. Balint, Balint also published recently uh, Ukraine Patronal Democracy and Russia's Imperial Endeavor at CEU Press uh, uh, last year. So that should be a really great discussion. Uh, Samuel, I will give you the floor to uh, uh, briefly present the books and then I will give the floor to Balint for some uh, comments and then we will open the floor for a Q&A session uh, from the room. So welcome once again and Samuel, the floor is yours. That's great, Marlene. Thanks very much. I'm going to now share my uh, screen with you. Please let me know if that's shared. It works. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, so again, thanks very much um, to uh, Marlene for the generous introduction and invitation to present my, uh, give an overview of my book today. Um, thanks also to Balint, who's uh, kindly agreed to be a discussant. And also I'd like to thank John for helping to um, uh, organize the event today. Um, so I'll try not to take up too much of the hour we've got together with this overview. Um, essentially, uh, what I wanted to start with was by saying that um, this book emerged out of my uh, doctoral studies, which I conducted at the University of Bristol. And um, so the, and then the inspiration behind it was, was a kind of mix between personal and professional uh, aspects. So uh, personally, I'm I'm not uh, Hungarian, and I don't do not have any family connection with that country. Um, but for different reasons, it's a country that I've come to know uh, quite well. And um, I've indeed I've spent quite a fair bit of time there over the last two decades or so. So uh, there was that kind of facade to it, but also a kind of um, professional uh, aspect to it as well. Um, you know, as I began to, uh, you know, spend more and more time there and I went through my different um, uh, university degrees, um, it was clear to me that there was a lot of uh, open questions about the uh, the trajectory of this uh, particular country's development. And, you know, let, let's not forget that this is quite a small country. And it's only nine or nine and a half million or something like that. Um, of course, there are minorities around it and et cetera, but um, one would imagine that given the, the amount of huge attention that it receives both in the scholarly and, and um, media world, that this was some monolithic, uh, huge country uh, which dominates a lot of things, but it isn't. So this was another uh, question which for me um, inspired me to uh, continue with the book. So some of the principal questions which I kind of grappled with were, uh, surrounded how can we understand what populism is in Hungary? I mean, this particular word became a huge buzzword over, in the last decade, uh, for better or for worse, and it's been applied to all kinds of regimes around the world, if we can use that in a non-pejorative sense for the moment. And this covers both uh, left and right populism. These are 
um, uh, analyses which have covered populism in the so-called global north and, and south. Um, so, and, and these are also very large and small countries as well. So it's very diverse, but the problem with that is um, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, to my mind, this is quite an over application of the term. So it, um, it kind of uh, undermines what, it, what this word really means. And of course, now we have the word uh, liberal and a liberalism, which um, my lens program uh, deal with, deals with as well. So there's a, there's a, it means essentially that this is very uh, unfinished uh, concept uh, within uh, scholarship. So I wanted to kind of think through that in relation to Hungary. And I also wanted to add in the kind of uh, the flavor, if you like, of agency. For me, in my own work, this is quite an, an important aspect. So uh, the question here is essentially, what kind of capitalists can we observe in Hungary? I am, after all, a political economist. And um, <clears throat> given its uh, small size, which I've already mentioned, um, it's important to ask, you know, what are the internal and external uh, capital flows um, which help support uh, the present Hungarian government. So these are the kind of broad uh, principal questions which inspired me to proceed uh, with this research project. Um, these are the six chapters, um, no real big surprises. The first couple of chapters deal with a kind of theoretical outline, which I'm going to uh, proceed by discussing shortly. Uh, chapters three to five uh, cover the empirical aspects of the book uh, before it uh, concludes. Um, as I've already mentioned, um, a lot of work has been done on populism, and um, Hungary is not, certainly no stranger uh, to this uh, application. Um, here, this is taken. This is uh, taken from the, the book. Um, here are four uh, ideological inflections, I call them, but four sort of types of regime uh, which I read and uh, I found quite helpful um, in their application to Hungary, not just Hungary, but other other countries and, and other um, parts of the world as well. So, um, and uh, yeah, what I would like to do is uh, draw your attention to two aspects here. The first is the third row down. So this is um, Ivan Cellini's work uh, article, the sort of a liberal prebendal, prebendal type, I'm sorry. So he's borrowing this term from Max Weber. And um, the important aspect here, which I use in, in the book is um, the prebendalism aspect. So thinking through how um, the sort of uh, what we could call the domestic leg of Hungarian uh, capitalism has emerged and how it's developed over time. I found that particularly influ influential. And the second aspect is on the fourth uh, column, this domestic and international aspect. And the, the fourth one down here from this, at least from this list of four, is the only one uh, which deals with both domestic and the international aspects of it. And uh, those those two authors concentrate on the European Union and how it is and how um, what they call the developed hybrid regime, the fully developed hybrid regime. So Hungary is systematically assisted uh, by the European Union. Now th these are all very interesting and important um, contributions to how we think through um, illiberal or populist development in that particular country. Um, but I think, um, and this is what I argue at length in the book. Something which has been kind of uh, missed so far, um, which I tried to ultimately fill, is thinking about how um, sort of non-EU or non-Western forms of, of capital do indeed uh, work to support uh, this regime, if we can put it in that way. And, I'm, and I mean this in a sort of non-pejorative language as, as far as I can. Um, Okay, and one of the uh, main uh, sort of uh, theorists, if you like, which has helped me to think through how I might contribute to this um, um, list um, is uh, the sort of the uh, the great uh, cultural theorist um, from the 60s, 70s and 80s, um, uh, Stuart Pauls, and his work on authoritarian populism. And of course, he was writing at a time uh, which is at the dawn of, the, of uh, what he himself termed Thatcherism, the end of the 1970s, and which became, um, which became uh, well, highly prescient, essentially. And what he described it as was uh, an exceptional form of the capitalist state, um, which, unlike classical fascism, has retained most, though not all, of the formal representative institution in place, and which at the same time has been able to construct around itself an active popular consent. Now, these three aspects, which I've emboldened uh, in emboldened text, 
are the most important aspects to my mind and which uh, influence me to go ahead and uh, proceed uh, with its application um, to uh, Hungary. But before I do that, I want, it's very important to think about how authoritarian populism uh, and capital interact. Again, if we go back to um, Stuart Hall, I mean, you can see the, the first uh, quotation here that I've lifted from him. Um, Thatcher writes at the forefront of what they thought was the new global expansion of capitalism. I mean, this is now 37 years ago. Uh, we can probably, most of us at least, could agree that that was um, certainly true at that time. Um, and then another core aspect of authoritarian populism is the is what he uh, borrows from Antonio Gramsci, the um, the sort of the, the capital relations that developed to form the conjunctural uh, terrain. And another aspect of uh, authoritarian populism, which really buttresses essentially society from below this side this time, not capital or large globalized expansionist uh, capital from above, but rather from below. And these are the, the well, quite well known uh, moral panics and common sense reactions. So as I got to read through more and more of this literature, I became more and more inspired by it. And then the, it became a simple question to me, um, is this applicable to Hungary? And of course, we probably would not be, be here if I fought in the negative. Um, so here we go. This is me quite a bit simplistically uh, throwing the, the adjective in front of uh, Hall's original coinage. But I think that nonetheless, this is, this, is, um, this is valuable and this is what I go at length to argue in the in the first chapter and these are interlinked which with the aspects which i've already discussed so far so here is the acknowledgement of the emergence of um well hungarian politics over the last 14 years in the first instance um which is uh, goes back to 2010 when fides uh, were re-elected um, but it goes back beyond uh, that date as well and there's a lot of literature on that and this, we can argue, or at least I argue, is a, is a form of hegemonic uh, politics. Another a second aspect here is the reconfiguration of domestic capital. And um, I've already mentioned that a little bit, and, this, and I build on um, Ivan Salini's work on the, on the Bendel system in the book. Um, and I think that that's been quite important to understand and uh, develop the Hungarian authoritarian populism argument. And then finally, I feel that this is a, you know, this is a way uh, to really understand um, how the government has begun to alter the state structures and consequently or subsequently the trajectory of capitalist development. And again, I want to really reiterate here, excuse me, the, the role of external capital. But I, I also don't want to just um, uh, basically regurgitate any of uh, Stuart Hall's original arguments. So I wanted to um, uh, marry this with, with other literature which dealt perhaps more specifically uh, with the political economy. And to do this, I fought through uh, the writers of capitalism literature, which is something uh, I've read quite widely in now, but um, I still, I'm, I'm still quite critical of it. Uh, but nonetheless, I feel that it still can um, show us, uh, illuminate to us, um, at least some aspects of the trajectory of Hungarian capitalist development. And this is it's particularly related to um, two uh, models um, which were added to the original parsimonious literature within this uh, theoretical tradition, namely the dependent market economy and the state permeated market economy. Uh, these are, of course, ideal types. Uh, but in the literature, Hungary um, is uh, noted to come close to uh, you know, um, uh, appearing like or behaving like a dependent market economy uh, uh, ideal type, whereas China is uh, part of the latter. So thinking through this was was quite interesting to me and, and um, to uh, kind of think through, well, what does this mean for the variety of capitalism literature and how far can this really tell us about Hungarian um, capitalist development? And I go and I deal with this in the book. Um, another aspect here is, and I want to reiterate this, something again, um, I've been quite interested in my own work is the is the role of agency. So I don't just want to kind of view this as a sort of a cold uh, structuralist, um, you know, uh, isolated forms of development, 
between states. Um, quite the opposite, actually. Um, um, so one way of, of doing that is to really highlight the emergence of the national bourgeoisie in Hungary over the last um, 15 years or so, or again, even before that, with a significant loyalty aspect. So there is that role of agency, which is um, very important. And, you know, another sort of advantage of this is it offers a method to investigate comparative capitalism more closely, excuse me, at the, at the um, political level. So, of course, when you when one wants to sort of marry uh, different um, theoretical uh, approaches, which are um, on the surface quite uh, alien or different to one another, there will always be tensions. However, I feel that this could be quite a happy marriage, at least in this particular um, uh, topic. And therefore, I wanted to highlight some of the fusions I found thinking through this, um, through these two um, uh, seemingly different um, theoretical approaches. And um, just a couple here, um, they both emphasize the role of external forces. And uh, they and it, they uh, they think through a focus that goes beyond the sort of so-called advanced uh, economies. So I wanted to sort of highlight uh, those aspects of it. And, and uh, one more I might add here actually is authoritarian populism does contain a sort of institutionalist radar, if you like. So especially when it focuses on um, institutions such as uh, the police. The subtitle of my book is uh, quite obviously a play on words from a previous book, uh, which was published in 1998, Making Capitalism Without Capitalists. And um, for anyone who's uh, heard me talk about this before, this is the book cover from that publication. And I think this is my perhaps one of my favorite book covers of all time. I mean, you can see two, what looks like two women uh, selling fish. It looks very cold. We don't quite know where it is. Perhaps it's in Russia and they've got snow on their hats. And given this was coming from, this comes from the 1990s, one would imagine that these uh, women were not doing this um, shortly before this photograph was taken, just some years before. So it shows you really, it really captures how far things have really changed. Uh, in that part of the world. In this original uh, book, which I'm sure many uh, people in the audience will be familiar with, um, being sociologists, they talk a lot of, they draw on Bourdieu's uh, cultural capital um, and to sort of uh, outline and underscore their argument really that uh, the culture was in command in the immediate years after 1989. So, um, you had people who were previously uh, in jail uh, for different periods of time who might have been playwrights or essayists or artists or some form, uh, some uh, similar um, uh, expression, uh, artistic expression, who then became to, and then came into, um, into political power. Probably Václav Havel is the most well-known uh, example of that. Um, however, what I want to argue really is that uh, politics is for sure back in command. Um, capitalism has absolutely been made. Um, and now capitalists are globally embedded. Um, they're experienced and they're very well networked. And this is the chief uh, difference here. And this is what I really want to uh, argue in the, in the present book. Um, whether 2002 is a watershed moment is an open question, and, and Balint, who's the discussant, and I were discussing this recently. Um, but whatever the case, in that year, which was the last year of Fidesz, uh, well, the, the second to last time Fidesz did not win uh, an election in Hungary, um, Fidesz essentially failed to um, co-opt big capital, quote unquote, and develop its own bourgeoisie, uh, which is something it has been able to do. Uh, since then, and Fidesz has been able to attract a uh, wealthier uh, Hungarian capitalists to their cause or domestic capitalists. So then, the kind of capital sought by the Hungarian authoritarian project, um, oh, sorry, of sorry, Hungarian authoritarian populist project has two broad formats. And these, this is what I argue is the right kind of capital. So this, both this internal and external aspects of it. Uh, so internally, as I've already mentioned, um, there is this sort of domestic leg, and I, you know, I, dis I discussed this using um, building on Salini's and, and Max Weber's work on prebendalism, 
and discuss, uh, this is in chapter three, the subsumption, what I term the subsumption of uh, domestic business. And then in the second empirical chapter, I look at the role of Russian uh, inward capital flows. And there's a particular investment uh, into Hungary's only nuclear power plant uh, to extend that. Uh, and this now is about, uh, this deal is, is about 10 years old now, and that is um, uh, under construction. Although I would like to point out that um, I go to lengths in the book uh, to not um, say that this is there is anything necessarily pejorative about this. Um, and I go to lengths again to outline many of the uh, advantages and disadvantages of this particular agreement. And this um, extends into the, uh, the final aspect of this particular list, uh, which constitutes the final aspect of the empirical part of the book. And this is an expression of Chinese inward capital. And here I look at the quite well known now Belgrade to Budapest uh, railway upgrade. Um, we don't quite know when this will be finished um, as the deadlines keep uh, and uh, fi expected final dates keep moving. Um, but um, I will show you some photographs soon and um, I can confirm that it is certainly on the way. So it should be uh, quite, uh, should be coming um, quite soon. Um, methodologically within the book, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a qualitative methodologist by disposition in general. Um, so after conducting quite a lot of different trips to Hungary over a few different years, um, I managed to speak to uh, four, well, there were 45 people who agreed to contribute to this work. And uh, these were quite quite a range of people. So this ranges from a, a former prime minister whom I interviewed and uh, down to um, uh, engineers working on, on the railway development. So, and the, the reason I did that is because I didn't just want to limit it to elite level uh, interviews, but actually kind of get a, a wider picture of what's going on. And I, I would also like to acknowledge um, the generosity of two of the universities in Budapest, although only one of them is left there now, um, really who offered me uh, visiting positions that really helped me to uh, facilitate some of the uh, data collection I was able to do. Uh, from my multiple trips, um, I've just got a, a few photographs I wanted to show you. So on the left is the nuclear power plant in Hungary, the only one. Uh, these are two of the original, sorry, I think this is one of the original blocks uh, which we, which came online in the 1980s. And so um, it's it's uh, this was um, uh, 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 developed through um, Soviet expertise at that time. So it's absolutely a rational thing for uh, Russian uh, expertise to come in and extend that. Um, these blocks are set to come offline in the next decade. And the other photograph shows a signpost with some information. This is outside a, a Hungarian train station. Um, shows uh, some information on the, um, the Belgrade to Budapest railway upgrade. And as I mentioned earlier, these, this is the uh, upgrade in progress. Um, these uh, photographs are both taken at different points uh, in uh, 2023 and the, sorry 2022. So, but these are uh, both this. This is the same part of the of the track just outside uh, Budapest. So I want to come to the conclusion now, so we have some time for Q and A, which would be great. Um, these are this is a limited set. Uh, within the conclusion uh, well, of the conclusions, it, it could have been longer, but I didn't want to take up too much time or space on this. Um, so, excuse me, the main uh, sort of concluding aspects I want to highlight here are the implications for the theoretical aspects. So what does this mean for um, uh, authoritarian populism or why or we could say uh, Stuart Hall's work more widely or cultural uh, studies more widely and how do we really uh, think about applying this kind of work to not just Hungary but uh, perhaps other countries as well and also of course this uh, variety of capitalism approach um, what what this means for it um, is it helpful and uh, might it be uh, workable in, in other parts of the world uh, as well um, to my mind, um, Hungarian authoritarian populism stands a much stronger chance of um, uh, self-reproduction um, with augmented capital relations with, again, quote-unquote, Eastern states. This is not meant to be a pejorative in any way. And I also want to highlight um, 
that um, the, the role, the continued role of, of Western capital here um, in uh, Hungarian capitalist development. And I think, you know, coming back to uh, the varieties of capitalism approach, um, what I label in the concluding chapter, the China, Germany, Hungary, tripartite is really important. So you have now, uh, and this is specific to the uh, ba battery production, uh, which has become uh, highly privileged uh, over the last few years in Hungary. Um, you have now, and of course, this is connected to um, electric vehicles and the China, uh, sorry, and the German uh, automobile uh, sector. So you have now Hungary, which is, as I've already mentioned, comes close to, at least in the literature, um, the so-called dependent market economy model, hosting or accommodating interaction between Chinese and German capital, or in the VOC language, um, state permeate state permeated market economy and coordinated market economy uh, models. So you have these in the VOC jargon, you have these um, three uh, ideal types, if you like, or three countries coming close to these ideal types interacting uh, with, with one another. And I think this is um, this really shows how um, this uh, framework, uh, regardless of how critical of it I am, still does have some uh, explanatory power. Um, I want to also, again, I keep going on about agency, but I think it's important to underscore that Hungarian decision makers these days have evolved into what I term capitalists without the right uh, kind of capital, um, and which means they're always on the lookout for it. And resultantly, there are uh, tangible alterations to the external orientation of the Hungarian political economy. How far this might travel over or how far this might develop over the next um, uh, for the remainder of this decade, for example, is, of course, an open question. Uh, but new rulings uh, from at the EU level on um, on uh, electric vehicles recently um, really show that this is uh, an, an important topic uh, that's worthy of, of thinking through. And again, this this kind of uh, it connects to the, the final point here. There, there really are some geopolitical questions. So. I hope I've done this um, this uh, this brief presentation. I hope it's done some some justice to the book. It was a long project. It was a very uh, worthwhile project. It was my first book. Hopefully, I will do another one in the future. Um, but I would like to thank uh, again all those uh, involved, and I look forward to any uh, questions or answers. Uh, well, my, hopefully, I'll have the answers. Any questions uh, you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samuel, for this great presentation. I'm now giving the floor to Balint for some comments. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Welcome, everyone, and thank you uh, very much for having me uh, for this uh, for this book talk. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, uh, to be a discussant for such a good book. And uh, I will have uh, some comments on the on the content of the book as well. But let me start first with the title of the book, which is "The Political Economy of Hungarian Authoritarian Populism." Now, when I first read this title, honestly, uh, I didn't know what to expect in the sense that I asked myself, what is there to, to, to say about this topic that's not been said all, uh, already? So, because just as Samuel uh, mentioned in the, uh, in the lecture, but also in the book, he writes about this, that uh, the literature on Hungary, the literature on Hungarian authoritarianism, and also the literature on Viktor Orban and his populism. Those are so crowded literatures. In the last 10 to 15 years, there have been so many books, so many papers written on Hungary and on the Hungarian uh, 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 regime and the Orban regime that I really didn't know uh, what else this book can add to all what has already been said. But I was very pleasantly surprised by this book. And uh, I would like to tell you what are the two things in which I think this book overcame this problem. It overcame this problem of entering an already crowded literature and therefore it started to add something to it from which we all can learn. I think the first one is already indicated in the title. It doesn't simply say Hungarian authoritarian populism, but it says the political economy of Hungarian authoritarian populism. And I think here uh, what Samuel does is really a very successful marriage of populism studies and of economics. From both of, this, both of the, these two branches of literature, sometimes they meet, in some works they meet, but I think there are a lot of synergies between these two branches that hadn't been uh, uh, exploited before, before Samuel, as I mean, because he comes in and he tries to bring in 
uh, um, um, insights from both of these branches and try to uh, uh, build them in. Practically, what he tries to do is not is asking the question, what is the uh, source of, uh, what is the reason for the uh, electoral success of Viktor Orban? So what is the reason for the electoral success of Viktor Orban's populism? And usually what political scientists say is that it is because of uh, electoral manipulation, it is because of the media, it is because of various factors that are related to the political story, to the political institutional setting and the political sphere. And what Samuel says is that, no, this is not enough to say. This should be acknowledged, and the book acknowledges this, but we should add the economic story as well the economic story, because those two spheres are actually intertwined. And we really need to develop a theory of capital. We really need to develop a theory of how economy and politics work together to prolong this regime and to contribute to its self-reproduction. I think this is a kind of approach that is already refreshing, that is already refreshing, I think very much refreshing for political scientists and for those who uh, work on populism, because I uh, have this experience that a lot of times political scientists are not that involved in this kind of a, a, a capital and economic analysis. So I think they can learn from it. And also uh, economists can learn from it. As Samuel mentioned that he read and uh, reflected on the varieties of capitalism literature. Now the varieties of capitalism literature has the opposite problem that the political science literature has. The political science literature doesn't focus on capital too much, while the varieties of capitalism literature focuses on capital too much. So they focus just too much on this and they forget about political agency a lot of time. And they also have this problem of focusing a lot of times on domestic issues and not focusing on the external capital relations as well, which are explored in Samuel's book. So I think he really can uh, provide something new by marrying populism studies and economics and exploiting the synergies between these two branches of discipline. The second reason why I think this book uh, 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 can overcome this problem of entering a very crowded literature is the real clarity of thought, the clarity of thought and the clarity of structure in the book. So the book tells a story about Hungary. If I want to read it that way, Samuel focused mainly on the on the theoretical part and the theoretical framework. I don't have to repeat that. But if you put it into a more chronological way, what the book says, it tells a story that there was uh, once there was socialism in Hungary, then came the regime change, and because also of the socialist path and also because of ideological reasons, the period from 1990 to 2010 was a period uh, very much. Uh, 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 dominated by the idea of neoliberalism and very much dominated by the idea uh, and by the reality of Western FDI coming into Hungary and defining Hungary's capitalist trajectory. He says, Samuel continues the story, that Hungarian capitalists, the national capitalists, weren't very satisfied with the state of affairs. They weren't very satisfied with Hungary being on the periphery of uh, Western Europe and the Western world, especially Germany, and uh, that uh, that uh, the Hungarian development and the whole market development is driven so much by uh, Western powers. And therefore, they try to uh, ally and they allied with Viktor Orban to change this state of affairs because they didn't have the right kind of capital. Rather, they wanted to accumulate this right kind of capital and therefore changing this, uh, this, uh, this capital situation uh, within Hungary. And since 2010, the project that we see is actually trying to change these kind of capital relations, moving away from the wrong uh, kind of capital towards the right kind of capital. This is the story of the book in a nutshell. Now, this story that is presented in the book, it is similar to some uh, existing interpretations uh, that, uh, uh, in the literature, especially left-wing interpretations like uh, the book of Hungarian scholar Gabor Schering is uh, uh, about the so-called, what he calls uh, the accumulative state. He presents a very similar story, but I think uh, what this book, uh, uh, how this book uh, exceeds uh, Schering's book is really the very, very clear structure. Actually, I should uh, really commend Samuel for his admirable concision, his admirable concision in this book, writing only in, in under 200 pages and in, in a very, very clear structure, defining first in the first two chapters, the theoretical framework, uh, getting and introducing a set of concepts that are going to be used, 
defining all those concepts quite meticulously, and then applying those concepts throughout the case studies, and then expanding the whole story in the contribution, uh, in the conclusion, and explaining the external validity and uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that the really the the story and the whole book it really is uh, clear as a bell, and uh, uh, um, it is it is really a pleasant read. It was an easy job for me to be a discussant uh, to to read this book and also to uh, to comment on it because there is uh, a lot of things that uh, uh, um, um, I can say positively about the book. And I think this is uh, perhaps the strongest interpretation and the strongest version of this story about Hungary, about this uh, capital focused story that some people allude to like sharing. I think this is the strongest version and the strongest, uh, 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 yeah, the strongest version that has been laid out uh, uh, so far. However, I have some comments. I have some uh, criticisms, if you will, uh, uh, also, and uh, perhaps uh, this uh, I, I should tell these just to just to stir some discussion. First, uh, my uh, my main uh, question um, is about the subtitle of the book, that is the capitalists without the right kind of capital. The book says that the capitalists without the right kind of capital are the country's governors, this word is used explicitly, and also that they are the protagonists of the story. And the book uh, as Samuel also emphasized, places a lot of emphasis, a lot of focus on the question of agency. However, who exactly are the agents? Who exactly are these capitalists? Are they the capitalists from before 2010 who were discontent with the Western dominated economy? Are they the capitalists who are now in position? Or is it Viktor Orban himself? Or is it all these people together? So who, who is the actor? Who are the key agents here? Because to me, actually, uh, it is really not clear what the book says. If we talk about from before uh, that capitalists without the right kind of capitalists are those who were capitalists before 2010, then the question arises that then what should we do with all those people who came after 2010? Like Lorenz Mesaros, who is now the richest of uh, uh, capitalists, if you will. And therefore, you should say perhaps that he is uh, among the protagonists. Uh, of this story, but he wasn't there before 2010. So how should we account for this? We, can, we could say that it is all the capitalists who are the protagonists. Okay, but the book also explains, using the concept of prebendalism, that these capitalists, these people in, who have economic power, they are subordinated to political power. They are subordinated to Orban himself. Therefore, they have limited autonomy and they have limited influence on steering the country's governance. So how can they be the protagonists and the governors even if they have such limited autonomy? So, or should we say that it is Viktor Orban who is the main agent? Okay, we can say that and I would argue that he is. But uh, then the question arises in which sense is he a capitalist? Because there are some people, there are populists who come from the side of the economy. We can think about Berlusconi in Italy or Trump if we are thinking about a more contemporary example. But Orban doesn't come from the side of the economy, he comes from the side of politics, and from the side of politics, he dominates the economy. So it is really a question to me, who is the real agent and who is the protagonist, who is the governor, especially because to me, it seems to me that the book tries to evade this question a bit. It usually says when it speaks about policy that these are decisions by Fidesz or decisions by hung the Hungarian government, as if these people were all one big collective actor, but on the other hand, the book also explains there is hierarchy among these people. So we should clarify the question of agency. That is the first point. The second point, the second point is about the, the theoretical framework, about the uh, authoritarian populism framework. I think the Gramscian language that uh, Samuel uses, the language of hegemony and the moral panics that he uh, speaks about, I think those have great analytical value. They can be used and they have therefore a certain appeal if you want to describe uh, Hungary or other authoritarian regimes uh, 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 in this language and you want to understand their dynamics. However, it is interesting to me that if we look at Hall's original concept of authoritarian populism and we compare it to Samuel's concept of Hungarian authoritarian populism, then most of the things that define the latter were actually missing from the former. So most of the things that he adds about describing Hungary and how Orban's Hungary works, he, what he talks about is authoritarianism, prebendalism, subsumption of domestic business, these were not part of the original concept. 
Well, okay, authoritarianism was part of it, but I think this is a similarity in language and not in substance. So if you look at what Hall meant by the concept of authoritarianism, he was speaking about uh, Thatcher in Thatcher's Britain, and what he was talking about is using populist rhetoric and law and order policies to suppress labor unions and protests while maintaining the rule of law. Now, in the case of Orban, we have prevandalism, we have media control, we have constitutional manipulation, we have a lot of things that are akin and uh, normal in, uh, in, uh, in modern authoritarianism, and that is, I think, uh, a different thing from what Hall originally meant when he was talking about authoritarianism. So it was just an interesting thing to me to start from uh, this concept of Hall, while the description, which is, I think, an accurate description, this description uh, has elements that weren't part of the original model. So my question is really about the starting point and uh, the 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 uh, um, yeah the so what what uh, what Samuel thinks about this comparison of Orban Orban etc. The third point is actually related to this that uh, although Samuel he doesn't make the exact comparison between Orban etc. in the book, but there it is alluded through the use of the framework. However, he explicitly rejects the comparison between Orban and Putin and between Hungary and Russia. It is explicitly rejected several times in the book and it can be understood to, uh, to a degree because the book is also, uh, it places such a great emphasis on external relations that if you want to compare these two countries in that term, then you really cannot put them in the same sentence because the Hungary is part of the EU. It has such penetration of FDI that Russia didn't even have before the war. So uh, it, the, from this perspective, it is understandable. But at the same time, Samia uses the framework of Ivan Selin. And Ivan Selin, in that very article that is being cited about prebendalism, he makes the comparison between Hungary and Russia. And he talks about how prebendalism exists in both of those countries, how oligarchs exist in both of those countries, and how parallels can be drawn between those two people. I would actually argue that the parallels in this sense and the parallels uh, between the Orban regime and the Putin regime those are larger than the parallels between Orban and Thatcher. So I think that this uh, should be uh, uh, taken uh, perhaps into account. Two minor Martin, points. Martin, yeah, would you be able to go faster yes. so we keep yes, some time for the question? Course, okay. yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, yes, I, I only have a, then perhaps only one minor point because Samuel already mentioned it and I should then uh, uh, get to it. It is about the, whether uh, 2002 was the real turning point. Samuel mentions that before 2010, during Orban's first premiership, it wasn't the case that uh, that uh, uh, Orban would have such a, such autocratic or uh, authoritarian or, or even populistic features. Whereas later on, uh, he he realizes in 2002 that he needs to ally with big business, and then he goes down the road that Samuel explained. However, I would argue that actually it was already there during the, his first premiership. Actually, my co-author Balint Magyar wrote about the uh, uh, he. Uh, explained the first, he published the first version of his mafia state theory in 2001, in a 2001 article when he was talking about the organized upper world. And the, back then he listed uh, the features which were already in an embryonic form. It was there during the first premiership, what we would see as an adult form after 2010. There are uh, uh, various cases of corruption already before 2010. So I don't think that uh, it is uh, in the uh, uh, it is a turning point in in uh, uh, in motives or turning point in ideas. Rather, it is a turning point that Orban realized that he needed to win big. He needed to win big. He needed to win uh, once, and therefore he had to change the strategy of Fidesz to become an apex predator in in Hungary and to uh, pursue very aggressive populist uh, uh, populist and opposition politics to take over the political scene and eventually achieve a two-thirds majority. These are my questions. I would like to pose them as questions. They're also quick criticisms, but they're also questions to Samuel. And uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, for having me as a discussant. I enjoy the book. And I don't think that these uh, points that I raise actually detract from the value of the book. I uh, really recommend it because it is highly readable. It's concise. It's well argued. And it should be of interest to scholars across disciplines. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Balin, for these great um, comments. We have kind of 15 minutes left, so maybe, Samuel, you would like to take some questions from uh, the room and then try to answer them and maybe at the same time comments on the, on what uh, uh, Balint mentioned. 
So I can mm. give you some of the question we had. One on, uh, could you elaborate on which fraction of the Hungarian capitalist class have been incorporated in the HAP project? Mm. Another one on how is the loyalty of the national bourgeoisie ensured? Is that favorable economic condition or the risk or the fear that rebelling, re rebelling would result in redistribution of wealth? So that's uh, uh, some of the question. There are also some other, I'm just uh, moving, they have been seen in some other. Maybe begin. let's begin with these two questions while I move to the other yeah. one. All right. Um, yeah, I've I've seen a couple of questions as well. So there's a a, a lot to, to get through um, in a short period of time. But I'll I'll try my best to at least address one. Uh, you know, as, as many as I can. Um, first of all, I'd like to sort of uh, uh, reply to uh, Balin, to our discussant. So uh, thanks for doing this again, Balin. Um, I mean, these these are really good points. Um, you know, and of course, hindsight's a wonderful thing. We can't go back and redo the book once it's once it's out there. But um, probably, if I could, I would, you know, uh, probably go a little bit more deeper in into the agency aspect of it. Um, you know, but ultimately, the answer is, um, well, it's it's twofold. One is I, I wanted to to write something that contributed to um, you know our thinking on agency broadly conceived because. Um, simply put, there, there is not enough of it out there. Um, I think um, agency agency focused analyses are, are really important, um, and I don't think there are enough of them. And this is what I've tried to do in in my in my work elsewhere out, outside of the book. Um, however, we we can always improve, and I, I think my answer would be that these agents, you know, is it uh, your question is basically, you know, is it the is it you know the prime minister himself, or is it the top echelons of of his government, or is it perhaps these business people, or whatever? Is it all of them as one lump? Um, so, you know, it's it's a it's a tricky question. I mean, ultimately, you know, the answer is that you know the, these agencies, these agents are, are always on the move. Um, they're always being changed, and when you have a particular structure which we can witness in in Hungary, whether whether you agree that it's prebendalism or otherwise. Um, there is, I think, because of the uh, one of the reasons, because of the the way that the Hungarian um, uh, political mechanisms are, I and mean, we were talking about this recently, you and I, um, over the last fourteen years or so, they've won so many super majorities, which is you know a, a two thirds of the percentage of the seats in the parliament, that they are able to then go ahead, proceed, and yes, this would be different to the UK, then they can change the constitution. Um, so, of course, you know, agents are in control of that, but then new agents come in and, you know, they're, they're assigned different tasks within this structure. Um, so it's a, it's an open question, but I would say that they're, they're always on the move and they are highly networked. And this is what I really wanted to get at in the, you know, the kind of play on words of uh, these cap capitalism has been made. These capitalists are very uh, highly networked. They're globally embedded. Uh, they travel around all over the place. Uh, they do all these different things so um it's um it, it is important um there was a um uh, quite a well-known um hungarian person in civil society I, I won't mention uh whom i met who told me that um you know and and this is related to your point on uh Orban being a sort of a politician before he was a business person right um the sense that sure maybe uh well tr trump is a billionaire first and then became a politician um, Putin, yeah, maybe maybe he's a billionaire, but he was a politician first. So there are still these kind of key differences between if you like, if you you know, I don't really like to reify this, but like the East versus the West, if you like, um, whether they are hangovers from the socialist period or not, that you know, that's a question for another analysis probably. Uh, but nonetheless, yeah, there are absolute there are absolute uh, uh, differences there, but they're all interconnected. Um, Stuart Hall's authoritarian populism and his elements inapplicable perhaps to uh, the hung to Hungary or the Fidesz case yeah. um, yes quite possibly and of course he's talking about a different period of time a different country a different group of actors absolutely but in the sense in one sense you know perhaps this wasn't implicit enough they are you know related in some way because that 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 period of of history 
of, of capitalist development, if you like, which came from, as I said before, what he termed Thatcherism, has been so successful, um, not just in that country, but in other countries around the world. I mean, of course, people often talk of the Thatcher-Reagan tandem. Sure, that's absolutely part of it. But of course, at the end of that period came the end of uh, socialism in Europe. And then a, a, a many countries uh, in that part of the world, of course, you know, there's a lot of literature on that as well, how they developed over periods of time and how they how that connected to their previous histories and whatever. Um, but um, um, but nonetheless, this uh, I would argue that different forms of authoritarian populism did sort of emerge in many of these parts. No, of course, it wasn't absolutely um, the same as it was in late 1970s Britain. Uh, that would not be possible. But um, what I wanted to do, and perhaps I did not do a very good job, was just to sort of, you know, think, you know, um, reevaluate Paul's work and the Gramscian language and, and put it into, into contemporary Hungary. And, and um, um, I, I think, I, I still think it's, uh, it can be helpful for helping us think through uh, this, this particular country, but I, I, t I take your point. And then, um, and then, um, yeah, so, well, okay, the, 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 your third question, I mean, I think I've already mentioned this about the, the difference between, or the similarities, sorry, between uh, Hungary, and, Hungary and Russia. I think I wanted to really emphasize that because Hungary's been in, you know, it's such a small country, um, ir you know, irrespective of the amount of attention it gets. Um, and it is, of course, highly dependent on Western capital transfers and German industry and other things like that, which we're all aware of. But it's also, excuse me, it's also uh, been an EU member now for two decades and uh, has been a NATO member for a quarter of a century. And um, so it's, it's of course, it's not a Eurozone country, but it has all these, you know, it's very embedded in these in these uh, institutions. So, uh, and of course, well, need, needless to say, Russia is not in that uh, category. So um, there, there are some chief differences there. I want to continue with the, try and answer these different questions. Um, so about fra uh, fractions of capital, is that right? Yeah. Um, the fractions of Hungarian capitalist class, um, um, I mean, there's there's been some interesting literature on um, financial nationalism um, in in Hungary and how and this is going back to sort of early 2010s and how um, different financial um, uh, especially banks were kind of bought uh, by uh, domestic or, or transferred we could say to uh, away from uh, foreign capitalists to domestic capitalists and this again ties in with um, some of the arguments in my book. So there's that fraction of it, I, I would ask. I don't really use that language in the book, but um, certainly, you know, as I come towards the end of the book, I'm, I'm beginning to, you know, spread it out a little bit and argue, um, well, maybe not argue, but just kind of uh, highlight uh, the continued importance of Western, and particularly uh, German uh, capital in, um, in, in Hungary's continued development. And uh, that cannot be, um, you know, leaded from this from this discussion. So, you know, those uh, actors or organisations that are close to, um, say, for example, the the automotive uh, sector are certainly part of this uh, capitalist class. But then, as um, uh, Balint uh, mentioned, there are these individual people who, before two thousand and ten. Um, did not, I mean, the, the, they were obviously in existence, but they weren't anything like the, the people that they've become now. Um, so he mentioned um, um, Lourdes Misaros, which is one person who at my last uh, reading was, I think, the richest person in Hungary, but I, I'm not quite sure. But he's, he's, he's not number one, he's, he's up there. Um, so, um, and before 2010, he was, um, he had uh, a, a fairly standard job as far as I'm, I'm aware. So that, you know that whether he is a, a so-called straw man or not, I, I don't really know. I haven't studied that myself. Of course, there's literature out there which uh, says he is and whatever. But you know, or whether you know how far he's hiding some kind of capital uh, that has been sort of siphoned off uh, from these sectors. Um, sure, I think that's work for others to to do. I don't particularly go go into that in the book. Um, but these are probably aspects of the, these are fractions of uh, the Hungarian capitalist class that have um, undoubtedly, I would argue, 
uh, been incorporated into the HAP project. I hope that to some extent answers the question. Sorry, it's, it's, it's a bit brief. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Samuel. Maybe we have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, from our colleague Julian Waller, who is asking, is there anything particularly authoritarian or populist about how Hungary's model of political economy operates? Or could you see it, the same model of political economy in a democratic country somewhere else in the post-socialist region? That's a good question. I think, um, well, let me start by saying that um, probably something quite obvious, and I'm very far from being the first person to say this, that, you know, capitalism or, or liberalism, if you like, always is in, you know, constant dialectical arrangement, for want of a better word, with illiberalism, if we if we would like to use that word, Malin. Um, and um, so, um, you know, consequently, yes, it, it can be applied to um, dem democratic uh, countries. I, I mean, I, I don't think I would call Hungary completely undemocratic or something like that. Um, you know, it's, it, can, it could not be compared to somewhere like, um, you know, China, for example. Or, or let alone the one, one of the Gulf states. So, um, you know, it's 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 um, it's still nominally democratic at, at least. Um, so, I mean, I, it's a good question because um, in recent work, which is which I've been doing since the book was uh, was completed like, at the end of last year, um, I've been wanting to uh, develop um, a concept. Um, you know, m moving beyond not just populism or Hungarian authoritarian populism or authoritarian populism, indeed, um, but actually looking much more at illiberalism, actually, and um, how that how this is very far from an east-west binary uh, thing. And um, absolutely, it could move into. I know. I think, I, as I understood, the question was about other more democratic or something like that, um, or socialist European countries. I don't quite know which ones. Uh, the the person means, but I don't know. You could you could look at a country like uh, Czech Republic, for example, um, where um, and um, Balint and I were talking about this recently. Um, pre the previous, um, I think, Prime Minister um, Babish tried to do similar things um, to uh, what's been happening in Hungary over the last decade or so. Um, was ultimately rather unsuccessful. Lost office. Uh, he might, of course, he might come back. That's a different question. Uh, but nonetheless, there were attempts to do that. So I don't know. I'm unfortunately I don't know much about uh, Czech Republic, but um, I think that this model could travel. Uh, this is another way of answering the question. And it's not also it's not limited to uh, that part of Europe. I, I think it could move certainly into the so-called Western liberal uh, heartlands. And to tie in to tie the circle, as Balint mentioned, you know. Um, Stuart Hall was writing about authoritarian populism in Britain, the sort of archetypal West European country. Wonderful. Well, I think on that, it's opening a lot of new <laughs> research <laughs> directions. So it will be time for us to conclude. I'm sorry we didn't have time to go over all the questions, but I invite everybody in the uh, people who attended and uh, post question to contact directly Samuel to continue the discussion yeah. or Balint. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Balin, for your great comment. And thank you, Samuel, for a great presentation and congratulations again uh, for the book. And we hope to see you to one of our next events at the Liberalism Study Program. Thank you, everybody, and bye-bye. Thanks very much, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you all. Bye.